Welcome. This is um, a session on understanding the roots of theological liberalism through looking at the father of liberal theology, Friedrich Schleiermacher. So the aim is, we're all familiar with uh, liberalism. I would have thought many of us are not very familiar with Friedrich Schleiermacher. Um, but you can understand the basic shape of liberalism and so much of our culture far better when you know Friedrich Schleimacher. Uh, Schleimacher, um, the day after he died, uh, one of his friends, August Neander, said that with him a new era, a new period in the history of the church will take its origin. And he was right. Um, Schleimacher dominated the 19th century and he was since his death really known as the father of modern or liberal theology. What I'm going to do is I'm going to assume you really don't you don't need to know anything about him at the moment that's okay. I'm going to take you through a little bit of his life before we look at his thoughts so you can understand because his life helps you put everything in context. So Schleiermacher, uh, Friedrich or Fritz as he was called, Schleiermacher, he was born in what is now Poland, but at the time it was uh, Prussia in 1768. Born to a family of reformed preachers, though his father was more of a Freemason than anything else, really. And here's possibly the most important thing about his life. Age nine, the family moved to a Herrenhuter community. Um, and the Herrenhuters, they were Moravians who were pietists. And what it meant was they wanted to have more than just dead orthodoxy, believing a string of correct doctrines. They wanted to have a living faith in living communion with God, to know Christ. And these... Uh, Moravians, they've been expelled from Moravia, and Count Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf had, had sheltered them um, on his estate, a renamed Herrenhut, or the Lord's House. And the Schleimacher family were profoundly impressed by the Herrenhut community. And uh, Friedrich's father was converted. And Fritz, uh, Friedrich, um, said that he experienced a birth into a higher life. And it was a good thing that Friedrich liked the Herrenhuters because basically he would then be brought up there. His mother died and his father was an army chaplain, so just abandoned him and he just never saw them ever again. And so in his time with the Herrenhuters, he became more and more frustrated with their doctrinal rigidity, as he saw it. Um, but he felt that he really took on board something that true religion has to be experienced. And he would say later in my life, I've become a Herrenhuter again, only of a higher order. Now it's interesting he says a Herrenhuter again, so clearly there's a parting of the ways at some point. And it started with a little club that Schleiermacher started with his friends, in which they started questioning some of the Herrenhuter doctrinal essentials. So divine punishment for sin, uh, Christ's um, sacrificial um, substitution for us on the cross, um, the eternal deity of Christ, he denied all these. But he he wanted to have the the affectional piety of Herrenhut. Uh, this really didn't go down well with the Herrenhuters or with his father, who basically broke off relationships forever, so they didn't even write to each other. Now, let me skip on a little bit. That's the most important thing to get about um, his background. You'll see, you'll see how very influential that would be for him. I want to skip on a little bit till he's age 27. Uh, a lot of the details of his life is just not so immediately relevant for getting his thoughts. So I'm going to skip because of time. Um, he moved to Berlin and he loved Berlin. He loved the salons with the uh, over a nice coffee. You could have a talk about sophisticated things. And the talk of the salons at the time was romanticism. Now, romanticism was basically the shadow side to the Enlightenment. So the Enlightenment was all rationalism. 
and the Romantics, think of uh, Turner, Shelley, Beethoven, figures like that. They wanted to say that Enlightenment rationalism is too reductionistic. It, it's imagining that we are simply brains on sticks, we're just calculators in flesh. And it's ignoring the fact that we have feelings, we have personalities. And so Romanticism is trying to bring out all that that doesn't fit within the little cookie cutter mold of Enlightenment rationalism. And this was the context for Schleiermacher's first book. His first book was called On Religion, Speeches to Its Cultured Despisers. And in it, he argued, basically, don't worry, romantics, don't worry. True religion is not about the dead letter of doctrine. It's about a living experience of the divine. So don't worry yourself too much about off-putting doctrines. Um, true religion is about having a taste for the infinite. And again, you're gonna see how significant that's gonna be for his theology and what that's gonna do. Um, very quickly, for the rest of his life, he spent most of it in Berlin. Uh, he helped set up the University of Berlin. And it's while he's in Berlin that he writes his main work, The Christian Faith, which is what we're going to be looking at together. Um, and he died in February 1834. Life done. Let's move to look at his thought. Now, as you're already getting to see a little bit, um, Schleimacher is basically all about wanting to make Christianity relevant, credible, believable to um, the modern age. So he was, in other words, before anything else, he was an apologist. But here's the key point. Instead of having his apology built on, his apologetics built on his theology, he did the opposite. All his theology derived from his apologetics. Very important shift. And he was all about pulling Christianity back from the rational attacks of the Enlightenment. So Christianity would be about religious experience so much that um, it's intellectually unassailable. Uh, that attacks on historical details are simply irrelevant. You simply don't need to worry about them, meaning modern people don't need to abandon being modern in order to become Christian. That's what he's all about. Let me introduce you to the, that work he wrote in Berlin, his main work, his magnum opus, The Christian Faith, it's called. Um, there is a handout, by the way, if you can see, if you want to um, be able to take notes on all this, you'll see my ordering. Now, I'm going to pretty much walk you through the Christian faith very, very rapidly. And um, the heart of it is where he starts. He defines the essence of piety. And this is the foundation stone. Uh, yes, I use that normally Christological term um, deliberately. This is the foundation stone for Schleiermacher. Piety is... <clears throat> I quote for Schleimacher, the consciousness of being absolutely dependent. The consciousness of being absolutely dependent. And the Christian faith starts with him basically describing the history of humanity as the history of the development of this consciousness of dependence. So in primitive days, uh, this feeling of dependence expressed itself in fetishism and um, polytheism, but it, it grew more sophisticated over the years, over the centuries, until the ultimate expression is Christianity. There's this sort of evolution from primitive religion to Christianity. Now, what you need to notice is in this history of religion, there is no sharp distinction between true worship and idolatry. Rather, the religious instinct is always a good thing for Schleiermacher. It's simply expressed in different ways. And so the history of the world, some of this may sound slightly familiar to you, the history of the world is basically a smooth evolutionary development up to Christianity. 
Now you could think, well, now hang on, so he died in 1834. We've got an evolutionary thought a generation before Darwin. Isn't that surprising? Well, not really, actually, because Darwin's model of biological evolution emerged within an existing popular evolutionary understanding of reality. Now, one of Schleimacher's colleagues at the University of Berlin was GWF Hegel. Uh, he was professor of philosophy there at the time. And <laughs> Hegel had put forward a massive um, argument for the evolutionary movement of all history towards, well, towards himself, bluntly. Um, one of the greatest footnotes ever written was by Robert Jensen about Hegel, and Jensen said this. He said, Hegel's only real fault was that he confused himself with the last judge. But that is quite a fault. So Schleiermacher's model of this happy upward progress of religion, it just sat well with the times and dispensed with any need for the supernatural. Uh, God's not so much about intervening in salvation. Uh, it, it's, it, Christianity is more about the culmination of a process. Um, and, and also the evolutionary model set aside uh, the problematic existence of different religions. Schleimacher, they're not competing with each other to describe ultimate reality, they're just different expressions of the same universal impulse, um, this feeling of absolute dependence. Um, and actually, I say that Christianity is, is the peak, but really it's just that Christianity is the highest stage of religious evolution so far. Christ might be superseded, according to Schleiermacher. Uh, I feel like it'd be a horrible soundbite if I don't add that. Um, and all this could be said because, here's the next, it's in the handout, but here's the next critical phrase of Schleiermacher's. He said, Christian doctrines are accounts of Christian religious affections set forth in speech. I'll say it again. Christian doctrines are accounts of Christian religious affections set forth in speech. Let me unpack what that means. Excuse me. In fact, let me do it by contrasting Schleiermacher with Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards, um, New England theologian, died um, almost exactly 10 years before Schleiermacher was born. And th there's interesting similarities between them and a huge difference. Both Edwards and Schleiermacher disliked the idea of dead doctrine, um, as if faith is mere assent to a list of doctrines. Both would emphasize the importance of experience of religious affections. But here's how Edwards saw it. Edwards in Religious Affections said, religious affections are not heat without light. They evermore arise from some information of the understanding. In other words, as Edwards see things, it is the light of God's truth that causes the heat of our affection of love towards God, right? So God's truth, causes the affection. And here is Schleimacher's Copernican revolution. He changed everything. He's saying, no, no, Christian doctrine is simply me expressing how I feel. It's not that my feelings, my affections are a response to doctrine. Doctrine is simply me trying to talk about my affections. And I hope at that point that you can start seeing that Schleiermacher has not only been so influential in theology, his revolution is complete and dominant for our culture today. What is the authority in theology? How do we know things? What do you feel? Let me, let me go on a little bit. So, um, Let's look at what this then does. So you start with the religious affections, that consciousness of being absolutely dependent. Everything's built on that. Now, what I want to do is go, okay, 
what does the theology that starts there rather than God's word, what does that theology look like? And I think a lot of this will be reasonably familiar, but striking as to how it's computed, how it's created. So he begins with creation. Now, just have a think before I tell you, what do you think if your feelings are the source of knowledge, what can you as a theologian say about creation? Really not much. And so he says, we have no consciousness of a beginning of being. And therefore, I quote, the controversy over the temporal or eternal creation of the world has no bearing on the content of the feeling of absolute dependence. Therefore, it's a matter of indifference. So is creation eternal or did it come into being? We don't know, doesn't matter. So we really can't say much about creation at all because we're having to work from our affections, from our feelings. Um, not only do we not know about any origin of creation, but also um, we, Schlonemacher argues that God being perfect um, simply established creation, um, perfectly established it, without any need for there to be any ongoing interaction with it. It was a very deistic understanding. And his idea was this, if God's perfect, we depend on him, and so he's absolutely dependable, then if he's perfect, then he would have set up a world that's perfect, meaning that he doesn't need to engage with it. He doesn't need to do anything. See what that's saying? It's saying, one, there's no fall. There's no fall, so there's no sin, so there's no guilt. But also, that's gonna be big. <laughs> Sorry, the, the issues here are all so big and I have to go past them so far. So please forgive me, you need to um, just see how significant each moment is here. Um, there's no fall, so there's no sin, there's no guilt. Also, because God doesn't need to engage with creation, th there are going to be no miracles. There's going to be no personal, individual relationship with God. Now, I'm hoping by this point already, and I haven't taken you to some of the um, really interesting stuff, I'm hoping already you're hearing the eerie sounds of Luther, Calvin, Owen, Edwards spinning in their graves. What can we learn about God from this, according to Schleiermacher? Well, God, uh, since we feel absolutely dependent, God must be the absolute cause, the one on whom all depend. So he's the cause of time, he's the cause of all uh, temporal being, therefore he must be above time, he must be eternal. Uh, he must cause all space. He must be omnipresent. Um, he must, um, he causes all that's finite. So he must be infinite. He must be omnipotent. <clears throat> and since he knows all things, he must be omniscient. And he says those are the basic things you need to know about the character of God, those omnis. There's going to be more coming up on the nature of God in just a bit. So that's that's uh, creation. What about sin? Well, again, see if you can work it out. What is sin, according to Schleimacher? What do you think it's going to be? Excuse me once again. <coughs> Dry cough, playing up at the moment. Um, sin, for Schleimacher, is essentially God forgetfulness. It's the failure to have that feeling of absolute dependence. And what that means, says Schleimacher, is you feel independent. But when you feel independent, you feel unsupported and therefore vulnerable. And therefore you feel scared and you feel isolated. Therefore you start going into competition with others. So you're fearful, you're selfish, that's sin. That's his definition of sin. Now, 
remember, there's no historical fall for Schleiermacher. And he, he, he's wanting to preserve something of the idea of original sin. He, he's wanting to see, well, where does this sin come from? And he, he says, effectively, we live in a God-forgetful society, and so we pick it up. Evil? What is evil? Um, evil is the sinful loss of God consciousness, um, which means that evil is something that is relative. So if your family die in a car crash, that's not an evil unless it causes you to lose God consciousness. Um, and that being the case, God can be described as the author of evil in exactly the same way as he's the author of good, because um, evil is just really a relative thing. Um, so because we have sin, because we have evil, we need redemption. Now, what is redemption for Schleimacher? Um, let's see what he says about the person of Christ. And I'm going to read to you something critical he says about the person of Christ. He says, the Redeemer is like all men in virtue of the identity of human nature. So he's fully human. But he's distinguished from all men by the constant potency of his God consciousness which was a veritable existence of God in him. So what makes Christ different to all other men? The constant potency of his God consciousness. So according to Schleimacher, and, and, and by the way, th this, this has thrown people because um, there were very conservative theologians who visited his church in Berlin and they saw Schleimacher had a real love for Jesus and seemed to think, well, he, clearly he loves Jesus, so he, he looks Christian. We need to ask, who was Jesus? Who was this Jesus he loves? What's, what's distinct about Jesus? What distinguishes from all men is the constant potency of his God consciousness. So for Schleimacher, Christ was not the pre-existent eternal son of God. Christ was a perfectly pious man. In effect, Christ was just the first Christian. He's not God become man, he's man become godly. And he knew what a revolutionary step that was, what a big doctrinal move that was. But he was eager for that because it meant, for example, you could get rid of off-putting doctrines like the virgin of birth and uh, the virgin birth. And he said of the virgin birth um, that within his system, the virgin birth has virtually no trace of a dogmatic purpose. So it, 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 as far as he could see, it was a pointless doctrine. And therefore, you could snip it out and you've lost nothing. So clearly redemption, if Christ is all about God consciousness, and just interesting to note, his God consciousness, he says, that God consciousness was a veritable existence of God in him. It's a very odd statement that it's not like God is quite a reality even, just a consciousness of God is the existence of God. He is not a personal God that Christ is knowing there's just some consciousness that is God. But clearly for Schleimacher, uh, redemption then is going to look very different. Um, redemption is more about Christ's God consciousness shown during his life. It's not going to be about his death. Christ's atoning death is going to have no place here because what is there to atone for? There's no, there's no guilt. Um, 
there's not really a personal God to offend. And God doesn't have anger at sin in this system. So what was the point of the cross? Well, Schleimacher said, um, his blessedness emerged in its perfect fullness only in that it was not overcome in that full tide of suffering. So it's basically on the cross, we can be impressed by how, how constant, how potent his God consciousness is. So the fact that he's still God conscious, even on the cross, makes us wowed by that and we're drawn into it. So it's a, a moral influence theory of atonement. Uh, and then Schleimacher deliberately omitted resurrection and ascension, um, arguing they're not integral parts of the Christian faith. That really changes what the Christian faith is, is if that's the case. Um, and Schleimacher bluntly, he, he doubted the resurrection. He believed that probably Christ didn't really die on the cross. Um, he only seemed uh, dead. So what we've got here in redemption is not God's mighty acts of salvation. It's the steady evolution of man. And it's not even that Christ brings about an evolutionary jump um, because this God consciousness is something we've already got. It's just that Christ has got a stronger version of it. So it's, he's a upgraded version of what we are, a slight evolutionary step forward. So Christ is an enabler. Just think what that does to your preaching. If basically Christ is not a savior of helpless sinners, he is an enabler of those who can do better. That's going to make your preaching very graceless very hectoring in style. Christ is about pulling us up to a more perfect stage in the history of humanity. Um, but, but since there's no fall to be redeemed from, it's not really redemption, it's really Christ is our perfecter. Um, and something spotted, worth spotting about Christ's God consciousness is, remember, it's not a personal relationship with God, so we don't get a personal relationship with God. It, it, God consciousness is something uh, distinct. It's like Christ is really imparting a pleasant smell, not a relationship. Now, Schleimacher then turns in the Christian faith to have a look at the effects that the grace of Christ has on believers, um, which is to share his God consciousness, his blessedness. Now, we know there's no such thing as divine wrath for Schleimacher, um, because there's no personal God who is angered by sin, and there's no historical fall. Uh, so there's no actual sin, no actual guilt. We've been created good. Um, so forgiveness of sins, it's really about uh, my conscious conscience being cleansed from guilty feelings. So even then, it's hard to see quite what pastoral comfort that's going to give. If guilt's not real, there's no actual divine pardon to be had. What are we doing here? Let me move on then from redemption to the church. So um, Schleimacher moves on to reconceive the church. I wish I could see your reactions right now at all this. Um, in this new community of the church, what we do is we help foster each other's God consciousness and we foster it through the witness of the New Testament and get this preaching Christ and so he said faith comes from preaching see how a phrase like that can make him sound so good to an evangelical he loves Jesus and he says faith comes through preaching but how so exactly? Well, it's when we remember Christ's blessedness, his absolute constant God consciousness, that's when we want to be rid of our own God forgetfulness. So that's what's going on. But then, okay, why do we want to open the New Testament? Why would we do that? 
not because the New Testament is reliable or authoritative. Now, the New Testament, how did Schleimacher view the New Testament? Remember, the Old Testament is pre-Christian. So it is really um, primitive um, and uh, it's a pre-Christian faith in the Old Testament. So he wouldn't preach from the Old Testament. Um, but why would you preach from the New Testament? Well, the New Testament, what is it? You could probably work it out. Doctrine is the record, it is us trying to express our feelings. That's what the New Testament is. The New Testament is simply the apostles writing down how they feel. And therefore, that influences and inspires us. It's not authoritative, but it's, it's inspirational. And since Christ's very redemption basically is just inspirational, that's as good as it gets. You don't get salvation, you get inspiration. And in the church, so you, you preach the New Testament, you preach Christ in that sense, but you don't have petitionary prayer. You praise God, but there's no petitionary prayer because God doesn't interact with individuals. You just have a God consciousness and so he warns against petitionary prayer um, coming on to the future what do you think Schleimacher can say about the future um, well very little and so what he when he's talking about eschatology he likes to phrase it as the consummation of the church because what he's saying is that um, when we use eschatological language it's not really talking about future events, as Schleimacher sees it. Eschatology is basically an ideal to which we try to aspire. And because doctrine is an expression of our experience, you can't speak of the future. So eschatology is just where we're trying to be, what we're trying to be like. We're trying to be blessed. We're trying to be heavenly. Um, so the last judgment is just about the separation of the church and the world. Um, and there will be no eternal damnation, he said, because the eternal blessedness of Christ is being disseminated throughout humanity. So let me ask once again, what can we learn about God from this understanding of redemption? Schleimacher says, through it we see the supreme being imparts himself. And thus we can conclude that the supreme being is wise and loving. I think it's rather ambitious to equate something, impart something impersonal imparting itself with love. The smell of sewage can impart itself. But there's the tightrope that Schleimacher has to walk. He, and hear how this comes up in the theology which has which is learnt from Schleimacher, even indirectly. Schleimacher wants to speak of God as loving, but not as personal. He wants to have both of those, and it doesn't work. But speaking of God as loving brings us at last to the Trinity. And this is put in an appendix at the very end of the Christian faith. And it's important to spot Schleimacher did not think of Father, Son and Spirit as three divine persons. Um, he said that while we can speak of the Trinity, he put it deliberately in an appendix at the end because he was consciously striving for a quote, a thoroughgoing criticism of the doctrine in its older form. And he said, the position assigned to the doctrine of the Trinity in the present work is perhaps at all events, a preliminary step towards this goal. And so the Christian faith ends with him wanting to get rid of the triune God. And he's got rid of the triune God because the keystone, the foundation of all his theology has been set. And it's my feeling of absolute dependence. 
And when my feeling of absolute dependence drives everything, that's when you get that shape to all his theology. And that, I think, should start being a theology that looks quite familiar to us today. And, it, and it's come through that Copernican revolution, that flip that he made of saying, it's not that our affections flow out of God's truth, it's that doctrine is merely an expression of our affections.